Today I've got a nice problem that was from the 2017 Pan-African Math Olympiad. And it's a little bit of a counting problem and a little bit of a number theory problem. I think there's like a lot of nice characteristics built into this problem. So our goal is to find the number of ordered pairs x, y, of which x and y are both positive integers, such that x squared minus y squared is equal to 10 squared times 30 to the power 2n. And so what I mean by find the number of pairs, I mean this number will depend on n. And then after we've done that, we need to show that this number is never a perfect square. Okay, so let's get to it. So the first thing that you probably want to do, since we're looking for these types of solutions, is to factor this as much as possible. And on the right-hand side, that means factor this into a product of primes. And on the left-hand side, that means factor like as a difference of squares. Okay, so let's see what that gives us like kind of immediately. So we'll have x minus y times x plus y will be equal to, let's just write it down and then we'll go through how we see that. So it's going to be 2 to the power 2n plus 2, and then it'll be 3 to the power 2n, and then finally we'll have a 5 to the power 2n plus 2. Okay, great. And that's because we get a power of 10 to the power 2n plus 2 because we've got a power of 10 living in here and then obviously a power of 10 living in here and then the rest of them are the 3s that come from this 30. Okay, great. Then we want to start making some observations and the first observation we'll make are that x minus y and x plus y have the same parity. So let's write that down. So x minus y and x plus y have the same parity. Okay, how do we know that? And so we know that because we see that x squared minus y squared is an even number. But if x squared minus y squared is an even number, that means that x squared is congruent to y squared modulo 2. But from there, it follows that x is congruent to y mod 2. But that's just a fancy way of saying that um, x and y have the same parity. It follows that x plus y and x minus y also have the same parity. Furthermore, we see that x plus y times x minus y is even, so that means not only do they have the same parity, but they're both even, because their product is even. So actually, we'll maybe put that as, in fact, we know that they are both even. And that's important because when we start splitting these factors, up among x minus y and x plus y, we know that each of them has to have at least one factor of two. Then we actually have one more fact that's built into this. Maybe I'll put the fact right under here, and that is that x minus y is strictly less than x plus y. And so that'll be important as well. And so now let's look at all possible factorizations of this number, what is it, 2 to the 2n plus 2, and so on and so forth, um, into the product of two numbers. So let's say all possible z and w, both even, such that we have z times w is equal to 2 to the 2n plus 2 times 3 to the 2n times 5 to the 2n plus 2. And this is like without any other restriction on z and w except for the fact that they're both even. Of course, we've got an additional restriction on x minus y and x plus y given by this ordering principle right here. Okay, so let's notice that if z is of the form 2 to the a times 3 to the b times 5 to the c, that gives us a nice way to count the possibilities for z by counting the possibilities for a, b, and c and multiplying. Okay, so let's maybe note that a can be between 1 and 2n plus 1. 
So A is not allowed to be zero because Z must be even. And A is also not allowed to be 2n plus 2 because W also has to be even. But the other factors don't share that kind of restriction. So that means that B can be between 0 and 2n. So in other words, that would have Z take none of the powers of 3 up to all of the powers of 3. And then C can be between 0 and 2n plus 2. And again, that's none of the powers of 5 or all of the powers of 5. But now we can count up the number of choices here. So this gives us 2n plus 1 choices because we're counting from 1 to 2n plus 1. This one right here gives us another 2n plus 1 choices. And then this one down here gives us 2n plus 3 choices. That's because we have to include the zero choice there. So in total, there are how many choices for w? So let's just remember the multiplicative property. So that says the total number of choices for w is 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 times 2n plus 3. But like I've alluded to, that allows for z to be larger than w. So if we need z to be smaller than w, like we have in this case, then we have to take, well, it's not exactly half of this number because our number right here is a perfect square. So that means there's something right in the middle. And that means that, in fact, there's an odd number of um, factorization pairs. It's going to be this number minus 1 divided by 2. So putting this all together, we see that there are 2n plus 1 squared times 2n plus 3 minus 1 over 2 possible choices for x minus y. But then after we've chosen x minus y, we have an immediate choice for x plus y. Or we actually have no choice at all. We're forced into a value of x plus y. But if we've chosen our value for x minus y, then we have a value for x plus y. Then in the end, we've got values for x and y decided for us. And so that means that this is our number right here. So this number right here, this 2n plus 1 squared times 2n plus 3 minus 1 over 2 is the answer to the first part of this question. And so now let's move on to the second part of this question. And that is we want to show that this number, which I've boxed in green, is never a perfect square. On the last board, we ended up solving the first part of this. In other words, we found the number of pairs satisfying this equation, and that number was given by this. So we've got 1 half times the quantity 2n plus 1 squared times 2n plus 3 minus 1. Now, off screen, I've multiplied that out. That's fairly straightforward. And we get 4n cubed plus 10n squared plus 7n plus 1. And now our goal is to show that this thing right here is never a square. And that's going to be never a square for any natural number n. Okay, so maybe the first thing we'd like to do since this is a cubic is to maybe factor it out as much as possible. And maybe looking at this, we see that 1, or negative 1, I should say, looks to be a root of this polynomial. And we can see that very quickly by using something called the rational root theorem. So possible rational roots here will be plus minus 1, plus minus 1 over 2, and plus minus 1 over 4. Because you take plus minus the factors of this term over the factors of this term. And so there's really not that much to check. So after checking a couple, you'll see, like I said, you can factor an n plus 1 out because n equals minus 1 is a factor of this thing. And that'll give you 4n squared plus 6n plus 1. And since this is a contest problem, it's probably a good guess 
that these two objects are relatively prime. So they're relatively prime as polynomials, or in other words, they're relatively prime, or their GCD is one for all natural numbers n. And I say that because otherwise, it would be more complicated to show that this thing is a perfect square. And there's usually nice tricks built into all of these problems. So that's kind of our next little goal, is to show that this number and this number have GCD equal to 1. Okay, so we'll do that by supposing we've got something that divides both of them and showing that that number has to be equal to 1. So let's suppose that D divides N plus 1 and D divides 4N squared plus 6N plus 1. Okay, great. But by the definition of divisibility, that means that n plus 1 can be written as a times d. I used a on the last board, but we can reuse it now because we've kind of finished that part. And then also we have 4n squared plus 6n plus 1 can be written as b times d. Okay. But now we'd probably like to multiply this 4n plus 1 by something so that it resembles this 4n squared plus 6n plus 1. And probably the best we can do is to make the n squared term and the constant term line up. So we'll do that by multiplying both sides of this equation by 4n plus 1. And that's going to give us 4n plus 1 times this a times d. But what I'll do is I'll absorb the 4n plus 1 into the number a and just rename it. Maybe we'll call it a prime. So we've got a prime times d. Just to reiterate, a prime is 4n plus 1 times a, but we won't need to use that structure. Okay, so let's multiply this out and see what we get. So this is going to give us 4n squared plus 5n plus 1 equals a prime times d. Okay, but check it out. We can subtract those. And after subtracting those, um, most everything cancels. So let's see what cancels after we subtract those. The 4n squared cancels, the 1 cancels, and 6n and 5n cancel down to n. So we have n equals b minus a prime times d. So that means that d divides n. So what do we have? We have d divides n and d divides n plus 1. So it's kind of well known that consecutive numbers are relatively prime, but let's finish this off with all the details just because we can. Okay, good. So now let's look at this number maybe. We'll look at a plus a prime minus b times d. And putting everything in that we have above, we'll see that everything cancels down to the number 1. But that tells us that d divides 1. In other words, the divisor of n plus 1 and 4n squared plus 6n plus 1. So any common divisor of those two has to divide 1. But that means that d equals 1. Because 1 is the only positive divisor of 1. Okay, great. But now if we've got two relatively prime numbers that multiply to get to a square, I guess we're working by way of contradiction here. So by way of contra contradiction, suppose this is a square, then that means that each of these are squares. So we've got n plus 1 is a perfect square. I'll call it m squared. And then we also have 4n squared plus 6n plus 1 is also a perfect square, but we won't worry about that for now because this allows us to write n as m squared minus 1, and we can insert that into the 4n squared plus 6n plus 1, see what it means for that to be a perfect square. So far we determined that if the number that we're looking for is a perfect square, then that implied that n squared plus 1 was a perfect square. We called that m squared, and then we solved n as m squared minus 1. And then also this quadratic polynomial in n was also a perfect square. So I've called that k squared. And now I can insert m squared minus 1 into this expression. That gives me 4 times m squared minus 1 squared plus 6 times m squared minus 1 plus 1. Now it's a matter of multiplying that out. 
And I won't multiply out all the details there, but what you end up with is 4m to the fourth, and then minus 2m squared, and then minus one. Okay, but from here what we wanna do is notice that this object right here is bound strictly between two perfect squares. And so I should say consecutive perfect squares. And if it's bound between two consecutive perfect squares, then it's impossible that it itself is a perfect square. Okay, so let's see how that goes. So let's look at 2m squared minus one quantity squared. Multiplying that out, we get 4m squared minus 4m squared plus one. But if you look at this, this guy right here is most definitely smaller than this guy right here. And you can see that because we're subtracting off two more m squareds plus one. But if we subtract off two more of those, that's subtracting off more than we gain from adding this number two here. Okay, so that's important to see. So that means this is less than k squared. But now this k squared is equal to this 4m squared minus 2m squared minus 1 will definitely be strictly less than what we get if we just put a 4m squared in here because we've subtracted things from that. But 4m squared is the same thing as 2m quantity squared. So let's see what we've got. We've got k squared is between two consecutive squares. But that's impossible. But Maybe you can see that's impossible, maybe, but maybe like going with the theme of this video, we'll do all the details. So that means that 2m squared minus 1 is less than k, which is less than 2m, just by taking the square root of both sides, or all three sides, I, sh I should say. And now we'll subtract this 2m squared minus 1 throughout this inequality. And that gives us zero is less than k minus 2m squared plus 1, which is less than 1. But by our construction here, this thing right here is a natural number. And that's because k is larger than this 2m squared minus 1. So when we subtract it, we still have something positive. So what have we found? We found a natural number, which is also on the interval between 0 and 1, not including 0 or 1. But this is most definitely an empty set because there's no natural number strictly between 0 and 1. And so that reached a contradiction. And what did we contradict? Well, like I said, quite a bit earlier, we assumed that our number was a perfect square and that led us to this contradiction. So that means that assumption must be false. And thus the number we were working with, which was the number of solutions to this equation is in fact, not a perfect square. And that's a good place to stop.